Are you ready to unleash your full potential and become unstoppable in your success and leadership? Welcome to the Unleashed and Unstoppable podcast, where we provide powerful insights and strategies for coaches, corporate leaders, and entrepreneurs. I'm Alexanne Carter. And I'm Carol Register, and we're certified master neuro coaches who are passionate about helping you overcome your limiting beliefs and optimize your performance. Each week, we'll be sharing actionable tips and strategies using neuroscience from interviews with industry experts to solo episodes to help you live a life of power, purpose, and possibility on your own terms. Join our community of like-minded individuals. Hit subscribe now and let's be unleashed and unstoppable together. Hey, how are you guys? I am so glad to be here with you. With you this week again. And I'm super excited about the conversation we're going to have today with a leader who's been in the leadership space for 30 years, in the wealth space, in the strategy space, all things that we talk about here. And we get to go a little bit deeper today. So hi, Dan. Dan McPherson's here with us. I'm super glad you're here. And I can't wait for you to share with our audience all the wonderful things, all the wonderful wisdom, I should say, that you have to bring to us. Hi, Carol. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. And it's still strange for me to hear the word wisdom and and myself in the same space, because if you were to go back 15 or 20 years and ask the people around me to pick three words that don't describe me, that would have been on the list. <laughs> well, I don't know how we can go through this journey, this experience of life, like you and I have and not experience some wisdom. And maybe you are listening to me right now and you're feeling the same, like I'm not wise or I re really haven't gleaned things. Talk to me about that, Dan. I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, I, I spent a lot of my life being incredibly insecure. I, I dealt with lots of trauma and craziness when I was a kid. And I you know, I mean, I dealt with poverty and drugs and violence and being exposed to all that. It wasn't all mine, but abuse, all these different things. And then I, I think that gave me this deep seated insecurity. I talk about it in, in the book that I'm writing that'll eventually come out. And I, I label myself from the past as the unintentional asshole. Well, really, that was that my ego covered everything. And I, in my observation, ego is always covering insecurity meaning that's that's what's underneath it. And that insecurity caused me to just doubt everything. Even if I might learn something, I didn't see it as that. And if someone would go uh, say something positive about me, I couldn't take it in. And I was seen as, and, and relatively accurately, as somewhat unwise, very impatient, and just in this place where I struggled with everything, but mostly with my own identity. And now that I've connected and I found my resonance and I'm, and I am comfortable in my own skin, everything changed. Uh, you know what? That is a very interesting answer. And honestly, I kind of have a pithy response. What popped into my head was, okay, Dan, give us three quick tips to get to <laughs> strategy X. And here it is, you're going deep and you're telling us you know, that you came from poverty, that you came where drugs were around, mental health issues. And, you know, we've gotten to converse a little bit and you've shared with me some of the deep trauma you've been through and the insecurity that that created. And so what I'm hearing you say is the insecurity um, led you to believe that you didn't have wisdom. And, and, the, and that I couldn't get it. And that you couldn't get it. So you know, dive in, tell us some more of what you learned, because having conversed with you a couple of times and seen what you do and the clients that you take care of, you've come to a completely different place in your life. And I'd love to know more about that journey. Yeah, I appreciate that. And it's it's been a journey. And I this is one of the things that matters to me most I, is when we talk about 
where we really are, the tapestry of our lives. I believe that our story is the only unique thing we have. It's by far the most powerful thing we have. I also believe when we share the good and the bad that we can help people. But when we share the ugly is when we begin to transform lives. And that's why I don't shy away from that. I did for up until maybe five, six years ago, I didn't share anything about story. I, I was like, nope, here are the facts. Here are the, the, to your point, the pithy response. Here are the three strategies. And I'm a strategist at heart. So I've got lots of strategies. I'm glad to share those. But it's the transformation that I went through that allowed those strategies to matter, right? We like we can learn knowledge, but the application of that knowledge comes from to you, what your question earlier, the wisdom that we've gained and the wisdom that we've moved through. And for me, there were a lot of things that I was, and then I was broken down and rebuilt. And then I kind of jumped off a cliff and rebuilt again. And as I've gone through this entire journey, what I've recognized are are just some crucial things. One is that your environment has influence, but it's your choices that create change. That understanding that we have agency matters. I think so many people, and maybe a lot of you who are listening to this, get to a spot where you feel like things are happening to you. Well, you get to a spot where you feel like you're you're helpless or you don't have a choice. It is an unbelievably rare situation in this world where we don't have a, an actual choice. And even then, we have the choice of how we respond. And one of the most important messages that I share is that this old saying that people have of life is 90% how you respond and only 10 percent what happens is deeply true. But I would enhance that by saying and, and maybe asking you, would you ever go to Las Vegas or some casino and bet your life on a 10 percent that you don't control the things that happen? Or if you had to make a bet, would you bet it on the 90 percent that you do control your reaction? Once you start choosing your reaction and choosing agency, everything changes in your world. Uh, you know, that it right there is has been transformational in my life. And the statistic that you put it in, I haven't heard it put that way. And that is so meaningful, you know, that we control 90%. So many of us um, have tried to control everything in our external environment. I have been guilty of that, trying to control Damn. the external environment because I didn't feel safe. And being able to control that environment environment gave me a sense of safety, but it was an illusion of safety mm -hmm. in many cases. And yet here you're telling me that I control 90% because I have the freedom of choice. Wow. <laughs> right. When, uh, it's an interesting perspective. I think back to my first heart attack or my second heart attack, I guess I, I've had, I had, for those listening, I've had four in a 15 month period. It's been a crazy journey and there's yeah. all sorts of things tied to it. But one of the moment that I was picturing was when I was laying on the operating table, it was, it's a cold table in an unpleasant space in a, in a scary time. And I had just signed a piece of paper saying I was going to die. And the doctor looks down at me and he says, well, how are you feeling? I said, well, I'm a little scared, but mostly grateful. And he said, and he looked at me, he's like, why? Like, why are you grateful? And I gave that fact that I just shared a moment ago, the 1090. Yeah. And I said, so I choose my response. Like, even in this moment, I choose it. But there's a corollary that I love and that that holds me through even more so there, which is that in our darkest day and our darkest hour, which that certainly was one of mine, yeah. at that moment objectively, 90% of the things in our life are still good. If you made a list in that moment, as I'm laying there on the operating table of all the things that are going on in my life, right then, 90% of them were still good. So how could I not be grateful? And gratefulness changes, and I, I'm sure you've spent a lot of time on that, changes, changes a lot of our neurochemistry and all that. It changes our lives. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've been a big fan of that. I've shared that as one of the tent poles of life and just being able to go back to that moment and anchor there that in that dark moment, you can just know I choose my reaction. And yeah. that, that says you can do it anywhere. You know, the, the, the way you mentioned identity, we talk a lot about identity here and gratitude, gratitude builds like, um, you could almost think of it like a barrier in the brain 
it helps build a barrier in the brain against anxiety, right? But you mentioned the identity and going into the ugliness to heal and then going into the gratitude. Um, tie that together for me a little bit more deeper, like in your journey, um, what took you from like, which came first and what took you from one place to another? As far well, as identity, ugliness and gratitude. Are sure. Yeah. So it's, it's a very interesting question and set of ways to tie them together. And I like that a lot. The biggest, the biggest catalyst of the what I'll call the beginning of my change was 14 years ago, which was the night of my second suicide attempt. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful to have survived that moment. It was an unusual attempt even, and I've, I've lost 149 people I know to suicide. I believe it's the largest pandemic in the world. Wow. And so I'm, I'm passionate about preventing it. I will never attempt again, uh, but I have, I have a reasonable amount of knowledge in that area for not being a psychologist, for not <laughs> being someone who has spent my life studying it. And What's interesting is that was an unusual attempt in that I 100% believed even days after that I should have done it. Now I would tell you there's never a situation where it would be the case. But that whole sense of I, I didn't, I should have, failure, everything else, it caused me to bottom out lower than any other bottom that I would have expected. And mm -hmm. it had occurred as a result of the ending of my marital relationship. And so I had left and I just thought my life was over and little did I realize that it was only beginning. And that's the thing, right? Endings are really beginnings, right? Mm -hmm. we, we live in, we live in a series of cycles. We don't live in a, in a moment of an ending and it's tough to see beyond that. But I, I, after bottoming out there, then started this climb back. I, and I realized finally, a few months later, I get to decide who I'm going to be. I get to, and later on, I would understand that I got to discover who I was going to be. At that point, it was, I get to decide. And it was, and what I decided is I want to be who I'm meant to be. I want, I want to live into that space. I want to step away from fear. I want to, I want to be kinder. I want to be less arrogant. I want all of these things. And that was swirling around because it was before my personal development journey. The second piece was after I began my business and I really had started my personal development journey. And I recognized that we can discover, uncover who who we are, right? We can yeah. find that space. And I just, that was when I finally started to become grateful, but it was mostly in the last three years that gratitude has changed my life and sewing it together as I've seen so many things. And I asked myself, well, like, why am I so resilient? Why, why do I keep pushing forward? What, what is it that is forward? Where, where am I going? All those questions that we all ask, right? Like why, why, what's the why behind the what? And in doing that, I started to discover, here's who I am and here's who I'm meant to be. And I'm going to tie it with a little bit of a bow on the end, which is earlier this year, for the very first time in my life, I was able to say the word standing on a beach on the East Coast of the US, looking out at the ocean just before an event that I was going into. I was able to say the words and mean them. I am proud of the man I've become. I am wow. excited for the man I'm becoming. And I've never before that moment been able to say that. Yes. Wow. Okay. That's let's stop. Let's pause right here. That is huge. That is huge because you matter out there. And here's Ken recognizing he matters. You matter, Ken. And I love that you got to say that. I am proud of the man. Yeah, I got to I got I to look am. out at the I, I got to just look at others and say, look, you know, my my name is Dan and I matter and I and I'm proud of the man I've become. And it it was very interesting. I love that you said you matter. My number one core belief, my core value in the entire world is people matter most and relationships are everything. But the little tiny asterisk at the bottom is you're a people too. <laughs> and I, I like to yeah. share with my with my clients and those that I'm working with that the single most selfish thing you can do is not take care of you. Mm -hmm. 
we get taught yes. that the selfish thing is to take care of you, but that's the, that, that is the opposite of the truth. And we live yeah. in this cycle and it's amazing as I work with people to break out of that and to actually prioritize themselves, how much they see their lives unlock. You know, I, I think this is such a relevant and important point because not only are, are we often in the spin cycle of trying to, you know, run our businesses and serve others and do all of the things with an empty cup is the way I like to put it. Um, we, we're not actually operating from a full place. And when you start to operate from a full place, wow, that's where I know that I have the capacity to do so many more things. So I really appreciate you bringing that up in the way that you put that. And your your journey of the breakdowns you've had, including suicide attempts and the getting to know yourself from dropping to the bottom, these deep, dark places into starting to uncover who you actually are and that you matter and finally celebrating the man that you become and being in a place of gratitude. Um, tell us a little bit about your self-care journey, especially since you've just experienced four heart attacks. I'd love to know more there. Yeah, self-care has been a journey. For most of my life, it wasn't. For most of my life, it just didn't exist of any kind. And we see this with so many people and particularly a lot, particularly even more so with guys a lot in the US, especially like don't don't take care of you, take care of everyone. But we see it for caregivers. We see all these things. I, I yeah. went through my life and I was sleeping three hours a night three to, and then four and a half for the last 30 years before, wow. uh, before I uh, changed that. And mm -hmm. I think the beginning of my self-care journey really is when I changed that, which is mm -hmm. that I got done with my corporate career. I leapt off the cliff, said no to these promotions, walked away from all the money, said, I'm going to go do what I'm meant to do in the world. Yeah. And I decided as part of that, all right, these people have been telling me to sleep. I think they're full of it. And yet I'm going to do it. I'm just going to let my body rest for as long as it wants. And I took a month. And I let my body be in bed as long as it wanted to be in bed that entire time. And it, it's fascinating how it turned out. And it was very different than what I thought. The first thing that I found is I, it took about a month for my body to heal because I'd been just abusing it for a very long time. And the second was that as it settled out, it wanted to be in bed for seven and a half hours a night. And I had previously been in bed for four and a half hours a night. Now that's three wow. hours. That's seven days. That's 21 hours. But here's the other thing, because I, I mentioned I'm a strategist, right? I, I look at the data as well. I measured and I was now able to do 70 hours of what had previously been my work in 40 hours. By being in bed 21 more hours a week, I got 30 more hours of productivity. I literally picked up nine hours by sleeping at 21 more. Wow. That, that was the beginning. And that's, that was the moment where I said, oh, there, there's the some stuff to this. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It started plus, to go oh, yeah, exponential. I yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, and, and, and the difference it made in what you were able to do operating from that place of self-care, you know, look at what you gained through that. And I know that you've been very successful in the coaching world and in the strategies that you bring to people. I would really love to hear about the calm strategy that you utilize. Um, and I can see where you starting to have the self care that you that was important, including the sleep was incredibly important, incredibly important for the heart, right? Um, how that would amplify um, what you do with your clients now and and the transformations that you bring them. I really appreciate that. And I, I want to give you just a little bit more on your prior question, just to just to give an interesting bridge that I think will be very helpful for the audience. That was the beginning of my self-care journey. I then, as I went through and as I was coaching, I discovered that 
the self care for caregivers was a huge need, and that that caregivers are the are the toughest ones to take care of themselves. And so I started developing time effectiveness strategies for both my corporate clients and my caregivers. And one of those things that I started doing was developing a specific way to do a calendar. And the the very beginning of it is that we wipe the calendar clean, and the first thing you have to put on there is yourself, your sleep, your meals, your exercise, and your dedicated family time. Wow. And those are all labeled priority one, which means nothing can take them off the calendar. There's nothing that can make them go away. You can move them, but you cannot remove them. And everybody talks about that and says, oh, that sounds great. And the the crazy magic is when we sit there in the session and I don't have them do the rest of the calendar right with me, but I have them do this part. They go to program this and they go to literally list it. About 70% of my clients break down into tears as they have to physically put it on their calendar because we're so against this. But when you start understanding that that I am priority one, that feeding into me matters and that that's what allows me to, to go and help others in an extended time, then it it's truly transformative. So I just, I wanted to mention that before I mentioned the calm piece, but that take a minute for anybody who's listening, go just blank out a calendar and put yourself on there. Decide you're going to live by at least this one thing. Put yourself on there first. Physically mark it down. Block your time for sleep, the right amount of time. Block time for meals. Block time for exercise. Block time for dedicated family time. When you do it, you'll feel a transformation in your body. It's kind of crazy. It's amazing that you can actually feel that transformation. And that is not surprising at all, even from the neuroscience perspective. Listener, you know, add to that, pay yourself first. One of the principles of wealth that I teach is pay yourself first. Because, you know, Parkinson's law will come in and steal your time and your money. Yes. And um, use up whatever is available. And it's a part of being intentional. Right. And, right. you know, I believe in that self care too, but I can tell you that it has been a journey for me to learn how to stop over committing and block out time on my calendar. And it still is a journey. There are still times when I find myself overcommitted and then trying to draw from this empty place to help everybody else. And yep. I'm really not giving them the best. I'm That's not, been, I'm not the... inspiring in the way that, you know, and, and walking the talk is huge to me. That's a big part right. of my value system. That's been, I think, maybe the number one topic in our strategic momentum group coaching this last week has been the idea uh, that there are three phases that we go through. We start by you start it in your career by saying yes to everything and you yeah. get to a certain level like that's And that's that's even at a very beginning stage there, there's a reasonable aspect of that. But then to get to any other level of success, you have to begin your journey to understanding that you get further by saying no. And then there's the evolution of that, which is, which is when you've understood yes, no, and not now and the, the development of not now, and you make it through those, those phases and it, it transforms your ability to breathe. And that leads into what you asked me before. I, the core, the backbone of my business, I'm a calm and clarity coach. And the reason that is true is because the backbone of my business is the deep understanding that the only path to true momentum, whether it be in life or in business, is calm, clarity, and focus in that order. And they all have really specific meanings, but being able to do that and recognize that if you're short circuiting, if you're not gaining the momentum that you would like, if you're not headed towards the wealth you would like, if you're not headed towards whatever it is, somewhere in there, you've got a short circuit of calm, clarity and focus. And if you're listening to this, and you're thinking, well, I don't have any of those, where do I start? You always start at the earliest one in the sequence. So if you, if calm and calm is 90% of people where they're struggling, right, is that they just aren't getting to a space or a state of consistent calm, or they have a different maybe meaning for calm of what allows them then to be able to have clarity and focus. But if you, if you're struggling with all of them, start with one. And that's why one of my most, <clears throat> one of my most common phrases is calm comes first. 
<laughs> calm comes first. I love it. Calm, clarity, and focus. And if anything is not in flow along the way, you know that one of those is broken. Now, I, I want to know, do you use neuroscience as well? To a degree. I've studied, I've not studied it intentionally, sort of like I didn't intentionally study therapy, but as a coach, you learn a lot of pieces along the way. Yeah. And and so I I use the pieces that I've picked up. My number one gift in the world is synthesis. And mm -hmm. I, that's in my case, I define it as picking things from a hundred little places taking a piece of each and making something better than any of them. So I have integrated a lot of neuroscience pieces. Can I quote you every fact about neuroscience? Can I tell you what every one of them that's from neuroscience? No. Have I read and studied a decent amount of that area and incorporated it? Absolutely. Yeah. I know that uh, that makes a lot of sense because you stated that Hey there, this is Carol. I just wanted to pop in for a minute and say, I am so glad you have joined us for this interview with Dan McPherson. What a powerhouse interview. And it went a little longer than expected. So we are giving you part one and part two. This was part one. Please join us next week for part two. Dan is a powerhouse coach and a lovely human being. And I'm so thankful that we get to spotlight him here for you. So see you next week, September 7th with part two with Dan McPherson. Ciao for now. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Unleashed Unstoppable podcast with your hosts, Alexan Carter and Cal Register. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review and subscribe. That's all for this episode, Wildly Ambitious Leaders. See you next week.